Hi, everybody. So welcome to the exam one review session. Uh, I've already told everybody that's already here in the, uh, the sort of live stream thing that I'll probably be going over chapter four first and then looping back to chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and then maybe going over the worksheets that we did in class. But I want to go over chapter four first because it has to do with uh, Newman's projections and chair confirmations, which I think is what people are having the most issues with. So the first thing that I kind of want to go so naming uh i can come back and uh, go back to this uh later but again i want to start with newman's projections and chair confirmations since i feel like that's what i i've seen people have issues with the most in the past and what i personally had a lot of issues with so essentially what a newman's projection does is what you're doing is you're uh viewing this uh this bond here straight on so this carbon here that this eye is looking at first is going to be this dot in the middle, okay? And then the second carbon right behind that is going to be the circle around it, okay? So you can kind of think of the dot, the two dots, the dot and the circle are being the two carbons that you're looking at directly. Usually this is uh, denoted as carbon one and carbon two, where this dot here is carbon one and the circle is carbon two. Okay, and so essentially what you're doing from here is 90% uh, of the time, if you're drawing the Newman projection, you're going to be drawing it in the, uh, in the staggered confirmation, which is just what this is right here. This is called the eclipsed confirmation. We're usually not going to be drawing it ourselves like that. Usually we're going to go straight to the staggered confirmation. So how do we draw a staggered confirmation? Well, what I like to do is, uh, so let me go down here into a blank space and I'm just gonna draw just sort of like an example here. So let's say that we're looking at um, this guy right here. Um, just give me one moment to write all this stuff out. So what if we're looking at this guy and we're looking at it in reference to this carbon here? So this is gonna be our carbon one and this is gonna be our carbon two. How do we draw this in a Newman's projection? Well, the way that I like to do it, I like to sort of, uh, before I even start drawing the Newman's projection, I like to redraw this uh, molecule where the carbon one and the carbon two are gonna be straight, uh, a straight line instead of this angled line right here. So all I'm gonna do is I'm just going to uh, transfer everything from carbon one, which will be this, and carbon two, onto the straight line here, where this will be carbon one, this will be carbon two. And so everything is exactly the same. I'm just sort of changing how we're looking at it. Okay, and this might help you see how the Newman projection is um, going to be reached, okay? So that's the first step that I like to do. You, of course, don't have to do it the way that I do. I'm just showing you uh, what makes sense to me. And I'm just gonna move it over to the side. Okay, and so then the next thing that I do is I like to mark off what my carbon one is gonna be and my carbon two. Uh, I, when I'm online like this, I like to mark it with colors, so like carbon one can be green and then carbon two can be pink. So carbon one is gonna be this green dot and then carbon two is gonna be the pink ring behind it. Okay, and so now we have our setup for the Newman projection, okay? And so what I like to start with, I like to start with just the regular lines, not the dash wedges or the solid wedges. So uh, when we're talking about an sp3 carbon, which is usually what we're going to be seeing uh, in a Newman's projection, we're talking about a carbon with four different bonds. And those four bonds are usually made up of two regular lines. So you can see here, here's one regular line, Here's the other regular line, one solid wedge, and then one dashed wedge, okay? So here, when we look at these regular lines, usually they're gonna point straight down or straight up at a Newman's projection. And how do you know if they're going to be pointing straight up or straight down? Well, it depends on how they're angled in the original structure. So you can see here, in reference to carbon one, this line here is pointing straight, or is pointing like angled down. So in our Newman's projection, it's going to point straight down. And over here on carbon two, we can see that this line is angled up. So in our Newman's projection, it's going to uh, point straight up like this, okay? Does that make sense so far for everybody? Um, I'm just going to continue on if there are no questions. Uh, so essentially what we're gonna do next is we're going to imagine if we're twisting this whole molecule so that we're looking at this carbon one straight on, like we see in this Newman's projection here. 
And when we turn something like this, it's sort of like we're taking the, um, the plane that this guy is on and we're just turning it around to look at it straight on. Okay, uh, forgive my drawing. Sometimes it's not the greatest, but uh, you can kind of think about it like you can think about it like this is your pencil. Okay, this is your pencil and or a pen and you've got this little thing on it like this little uh, It's where you hook it onto things. This can represent your solid wedge and then we when we turn the pen Here's the point of the pen and that uh, little um, That little thingy on the pen is now to the right when we turn the pen. Okay we can sort of think about this in the same way as the solid wedges because the solid wedges were sticking out of the screen towards us and all we're doing is we're turning this whole molecule so that we're looking at this carbon straight on and by doing that our solid wedge which is going to be our CL is going to be on our right and that leaves only this spot here this third spot to be our dashed wedge on the left okay and then now's the easy part all of the solid wedges and the dashed wedges are gonna be on the same side. So we can see here, this H is on a solid wedge and the CL is on a solid wedge. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna put the H on the same side as the CL and then the BR, which is on a dashed wedge, on the same side as the other BR. And that's how you draw a Newman's projection. Uh, what I always used to do on my, uh, okay, so somebody asked me why CL is on the right. So the reason CL is on the right is essentially what we're doing is we're turning this whole um, molecule as if it's on a pivot so that we're looking straight at carbon one head on. And by doing that, it's sort of like you can imagine this thing is like a triangle. So uh, when we're looking at it like this, the triangle is sort of at an angle like this, okay? But then when we turn it, we're looking at the triangle straight on and if the seal was on this corner of the triangle here, now it's on this corner of the triangle there. And the BR, which is on the dash wedge, is gonna be right here. And then this is gonna be our central carbon right here. So that's why CL is on the right. It's just sort of a perspective thing, okay? And so what I always used to do on my uh, tests or when I was doing homework, I always like took my either my pencil or my pen and I marked one side as like a wedge side and one side as a dashed wedge side. And I would turn my pencil during the test or, or homeworks just to see which side my wedge would be on. Okay, does that make sense so far? Um, and did I answer your question about the YCLs on the right? I'm just gonna go ahead and erase some stuff real quick so we can go on to the next point, but. Yeah, I'm, ab I'm about to do another example uh, with actually the same molecule. Oh, oops, didn't wanna erase that. So let's imagine that instead of looking at this molecule straight on from that carbon, we're looking at it straight on from the other carbon. And what do I, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is instead of looking at this guy from this carbon over here, let's imagine we're looking at it from this carbon over here. So the pink here is gonna be our C1, and then the green is gonna be our C2 now, okay? And so now we're gonna be turning it a different way. We're gonna sort of be turning it, so in this case, where we looked at this guy straight on, we turned it sort of to the right, and when we're looking at this guy over here, we're gonna be turning it to the left. So now everything's gonna sort of be opposite. So when we turn this guy to the left, when we pivot over, uh, yes, also you're going to be told what C1 or C2, and sometimes they'll tell you it at, with arrows. So like whichever carbon comes first to the arrow, so you can see here, this carbon here is the first one touched by the arrow, that's gonna be your carbon one. So back to this, uh, when we were looking at uh, the green carbon straight on, we turn this thing sort of to the right, but now we're looking at a different perspective. So now we're gonna sort of turn it to the left. So now we're looking at the pink carbon straight on, and this here makes the solid wedge be on the right, or I mean on the left, sorry, and the dashed wedge be on the right. So it's as if, like, like we said before, here's the triangle from before. We turn it so it looks like this, and now, so the H was here and the BR was here, and now the H is on the left and the BR is on the right, and again, the remaining line is just either going to be straight up or straight down. And in this case, it's going to be straight up. Okay. And again, like we said before, the solid wedges are going to be on the same side. So the CL that's on a solid wedge over here 
is going to be on the same side as the H that was on a solid wedge. Uh, and then the BR is going to be on the same side as, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I meant to write BR instead of H, sorry. Um, let me erase this. So the BR, which is on the dashed wedge, is going to be towards the right, okay? And we can see here that the CL, which is on a solid wedge, is going to be on the same side as the H, which was also on a solid wedge. And then the other BR, which is on a dashed wedge, is going to be on the same side as the dashed wedge, which the BR was on before. Okay, does that help answer questions about Newman's projections? Next, we're going to go into how do we go from a Newman's projection to just the molecular formula? Okay. Yes, okay, so we're going to do one more example from the left. Um, uh, so let me just, so I'm making this up on the fly. Um, let's make, I don't know, uh, BR. I don't know if you can tell, but BR and CL are my, my favorite ones. Yes, we're going to be talking about gauche, anti-staggered, and eclipsed in a little bit. I just want to, uh, I just want to make sure that we all understand the structure of the Newman's projection. And then we'll talk about how the energy changes when we twist around the bond. Okay. So now let's just do, um, I don't know, this can be H and then this can be um, CH3. Okay, so um, let's say that um, we're looking at it from this side here, okay? That's gonna mean this carbon is gonna be carbon one and then this carbon right behind it is gonna be carbon two. Note that it's always gonna, the Newman's projection is always gonna handle carbons that are directly connected to each other. This here is not going to be carbon two, or this, sorry, this should be carbon two. This carbon here is not going to be carbon two because it's not directly attached to carbon one, okay? So now let's draw the, just the base structure of the Newman projection. Here is carbon one, and then here is carbon two, okay? Great, so we have our base here, okay? Uh, somebody is saying that the screen is frozen. It's, is it, is it frozen for everybody? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna stop my screen share. Uh, I'm actually going to take a screenshot of this and then I'm gonna stop my screen share and start it again uh, and see if that fix that, fixes it. How does, is that, is that good for everybody? If I just stop it and yeah, restart it. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So let's, uh, oh, it says, uh, let me stop my share and then I will um, screen share again. We'll screen share on the, the snip and sketch that I was doing before, okay? So we can see here that this is like, this is what we were looking at before, right? Uh, so carbon one, carbon two, uh, all that stuff, I just drew it here. Uh, did you all get to see this stuff before? Did you, did you see me draw out all this stuff, or at no. least most of it? Yeah, no. the last time we saw you were back on the, the viewer slides. Okay, so what exactly I'm doing here is I just I just made up this guy right here. Uh, and then what I'm doing here is carbon one is going to be this pink carbon here and carbon two is going to be this pink, this green carbon there. And what I was saying is that carbon one is always going to be directly attached to carbon two. And so what that means, that means that this carbon here can never be uh, the carbon two as long as this is carbon one. Okay, does that make sense? Sure. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do exactly what I did before, where I first start with carbon one. So let's look at carbon one here. I know that regular lines are either going to be straight up or straight down. So this line here is just going to be straight up. And again, I know that straight up because it's angled upwards. Okay. And so Let's again imagine that C1, instead of looking like uh, this, it's just a triangle where each point of the triangle is a different atom, where the, the top point is going to be C1, this uh, right point is going to be H, and then this far point is going to be CH3, okay? All I'm doing is I'm rotating this guy, so I'm looking at the triangle straight on. So H is going to be on the left, C1 is going to be on the top, which makes sense because that's just going to be right here, and then CH3 is going to be on the right, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add that to my Newman projection. So this is going to be CH3, and then this is going to be H. Let me erase some stuff. Okay? Does that make sense so far? Yeah, sort of like a triangle with an antenna. 
uh, where the antenna is the uh, the line. I usually just drop the antenna because I find it easier to draw it like a triangle than a triangle with an antenna. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. And again, now we get to the back portion, which is a little bit easier in my opinion, because the uh, the line, so this line here, is just going to be straight down because it's angled downward and it's not on a dash or a wedge. And this line, this line is also known as CH2, CH3. It's just in line angle form. So you might see me write it like this, where each one of these uh, dots is going to be a carbon, or I could have written it like CH2, CH3. Either one would have been correct, okay? So now that we've taken care of the line, we know that the solid wedges will match up and the dashed wedges will match up. So since Br is on a solid wedge, it will match up with hydrogen, which is also on a solid wedge. And then hydrogen over here, which is on a dashed wedge, will match up with the CH3, which is also on a dashed wedge. And so then there is our finished Newman's projection. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to stop this share in particular, and I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so we're back to the PowerPoint. Um, and so I'm going to just move on to talk about Gauche, Anti, and uh, what was the other question about? Uh, Gauche, Anti, and Eclipsed. Okay, so Staggered and Eclipsed are usually paired together, and then Gauche and Anti are usually paired together. So when we're talking about staggered and anti, we're usually talking about the whole uh, Newman projection overall. When we're talking about anti or gauche, we're talking about two, uh, two atoms in particular or two parts of the molecule in particular that are attached to the Newman's projection. So in this case, um, this guy here is gonna be staggered. And the reason I know that is because the H's or the atoms are not right on top of each other. So every single one of these guys is gonna be staggered, okay? And an eclipsed basically means that everything is right on top of each other. Each atom is eclipsing another. So we see here, all of these are eclipsed, okay? So that's the difference between staggered and eclipse. Now, what does Gauche and anti mean? Gauche and anti are usually used to talk about specific atoms. So anti means that they're on opposite ends. So here, the two red H's are anti. And then here, and then Gauche means next to each other. So here we can see these two H's are Gauche to each other. Usually we'll be talking about uh, Gauche and anti in terms of a staggered conformation, okay? And so uh, one of the questions in one of the worksheets here was talking about uh, staggered gauche and staggered anti. Like I said before, anti and gauche, you do not need to memorize the dihedral angles, but it's sort of easy to memorize because the, the anti is going to be 180 degrees apart because it's just in a straight line. And then HA and HB will be 60 degrees before, apart, which is just like the 60 degrees of a triangle. And so Essentially, like I said before, Gauche and Anti are going to be associated with the staggered conformation and not the eclipse conformation. Okay? Uh, so, and then eclipse here, essentially what that means is there's a zero degree difference between the two because they are eclipsing each other. They're right on top of each other. So just to reiterate, staggered and eclipsed are conformations of a Newman's projections. Anti and Gauche are terms that we describe atoms on a staggered conformation of a Newman's projection. Okay? Okay, so let's continue on. Let's, uh, oops, wrong chapter. So like we said before, um, or like we discussed in class rather, uh, the eclipsed is going to be in higher in energy than the staggered. Why is this? This is because of something called torsional strain. I always think of torsional strain as like the strain of twisting, because if you've ever taken physics or whatever, you refer to that as sort of torque. So the torsional strain is the strain of twisting, okay? So that's, and the reason that eclipsed, uh, eclipsed uh, conformations aren't higher in energy than staggered conformation are because of that torsional strain. Okay, there's a few more strains that we talk about, and that's something called steric strain. So we're going to see steric and torsional strain when we're talking about Newman's projections. And then the last type of strain, which is called angle strain, 
we'll be talking about when we're talking about cycloalkanes, okay? So here, let's, uh, let's investigate steric strain. Steric strain is the strain of having two large atoms together, or two large groups of atoms together. So if we look here, like in this example right here, CH3, CH3, they're very close together. They're fighting for space. That is steric strain. And you can see here that this also has some steric strain, but it's not as bad as this guy. Now, torsional strain occurs when you're in the eclipsed form. So this has torsional strain, this does not, okay? And so that's why some of these, uh, these conformations are on higher in energy than others. So if we look at one, and, and one, I guess, both on the ends, neither one of them have a torsional nor steric strain because the CH3s are as far apart from each other as possible, and it's in the staggered conformation, okay? But then we look at th two and six. Two and six, the CH3s are still really far apart, but it still has torsional strain. So that's why it's higher in energy than something in the staggered conformation. And then we go back down to look at three and five. Three and five, again, no torsional strain, but it does have steric strain because those CH3 groups are close together. So this means that they're slightly higher in energy than those without the steric strain. And then finally, there's four, which is the highest in energy. Four has both torsional and steric strain because it's in the eclipsed form and it has two large groups together, which means it has both torsional and steric strain. And yes, one has minimized strain because it does, it is in the staggered conformation, so it has minimal torsional strain and its large groups, so CH3 and CH3, are far apart from each other, so it has minimized steric strain. So together, that is minimized strain overall. All right. Thank you. Okay. So essentially, that's everything that we have to worry about with Newman's projections. So what would be a question with Newman's projections? So a question might be, arrange these Newman projections in greatest, uh, greatest energy to least energy. And what that means is most unstable to least unstable. So let's say that I have a Cl here, CH3 here, and then H. H. Usually these questions are gonna be fairly simple and fairly straightforward. Oh, sorry, I put that H in the wrong place. So it shouldn't be too confusing when you get them. So let's say that we had um, this. Sorry, I'm making these up as I go, so I'm going as fast as I can. Um, so what the, okay, so two of these are gonna have the same energy state because, um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to go as fast as I can. That's H and then, Okay, so let's order these from greatest energy to least energy, and then two of these, like I said before, are going to have the same energy levels, okay? So the one with the highest energy is going to be this guy right here, because it has torsional strain and steric strain. You see here, Cl and CH3, both of the biggest groups on these carbons are very close together, so it's going to have a steric strain, and it's eclipsed, so it's going to have torsional strain, okay? And then this guy here, this guy is going to have minimized steric strain, but it's going to have torsional strain. And the same thing with this guy here. Even though these things are moved around, so like CH was up on top in this one, and now it's on to the side in this one, they're both going to have the same amount of un instability because those, those big groups are still pretty far from each other, but they still are both eclipsed. Okay? Does all that make sense? Oh yeah, 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 they're supposed to be, all of these are supposed to be CH3s. I'm just going as fast as possible, so I probably dropped a three now and then, okay. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the third type of strain, and this is called ring strain. Re okay, so somebody's still a little confused about torsional strain versus steric strain. Okay, so um, let's say that I have two CH3s really close to each other, or yeah, and they're on different molecules, that's important. These CH3s are going to be pretty big, so they're going to be fighting for space. So they're going to be pushing against each other to fight for space. That is steric strain. So steric strain can occur anywhere there are big molecules next to each other. Torsional strain 
is the strain that occurs when you twist a Newman's projections. So like torsional twist, TT. So when you twist a torsional, or when you twist a Newman's projection into the eclipsed form, it's gonna have torsional strain, but that doesn't mean it's going to have steric strain, okay? So just to re reiterate, this guy here, it's big groups are far apart from each other, so they're not going to be fighting for space. However, this guy is, has been twisted into its eclipsed form, so it's going to have torsional strain, but no steric strain, okay? Does that answer your question about the difference between torsional and steric strain? Okay, perfect. Okay, so... so do all um, eclipsed have torsional strain? Yes. Okay. All eclipsed have torsional strain because, okay, again, uh, I'm going to scroll up here. So you see, uh, wrong graph. So you see here that the, uh, the eclipsed form here is higher in energy than the staggered form here. This is because not of steric strain because you can see here all of these hydrogens are the same size and they're as small as possible. So we're reducing the steric strain, but what is causing this raise, the, what is causing this raised energy? That would be the torsional strain, okay? So eclipsed is torsional strain, but it does not mean steric strain. Steric strain means big groups close to each other, okay? okay All right. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so we talked about steric strain. We talked about torsional strain. Now there's one more strain we need to be look, look, on the lookout for, and this is called ring strain. So what ring strain is, it's the strain on the carbons that are sp3. What does this mean? So essentially an sp3 carbon is going to want to be a tetrahedral carbon. Uh, okay, somebody asked a question in the chat. They said, so the more eclipsed, the more torsional strain. A CH3 eclipsing an H is not as much torsional strain as a CH3 eclipsing another strain. Um, or eclipsing another CH3. So, so that's sort of a, um, a dangerous road to go down because while yes, the energy probably changes, that energy change is not something that we are worried about with. So I'm going to go back up to the uh, Newman's projection again. So the reason why this guy is higher in energy than the other things with torsional strain is because this guy has two CH3s next to each other, which means it also has steric strain. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me pause the recording real quickly. Okay. Sorry about that pause in the recording, but back to this. So back to the example. Uh, so somebody asked in the class, uh, which one uh, would have, uh, which one would have the second highest energy and the lowest energy? So uh, when we're talking about strain here, uh, eclipse, the torsional eclipse strain is going to be higher than steric strain generally. So that's why these eclipsed forms are higher in energy than these with steric strain. Okay. And then, uh, so uh, which one have the second highest energy? So one of these, these eclipsed that don't have steric strain would be the next highest, and the lowest would be the ones with the with no torsional strain, which means they're staggered, and no um, steric strain, which means the big groups are as far apart as possible. Okay? Does that all make sense for everybody? Uh, if so, okay, I'm just going to continue on. Again, stop me anytime. I'm always willing to go back. So ring strain, back to this ring strain stuff. So the reason we have ring strain is because in a cycloalkane, which means an alkane in a cycloform, there, the carbons are gonna be sp3 hybridized, which means they have four electron groups around them, which means that they want to be in the tetrahedral uh, molecular geometry position, which means they want about 109 degrees between each bond, okay? But when you're in a cycloform, usually it's going to force the, the bonds uh, smaller than 109 degrees. An exception to this rule would be the, um, the uh, cyclohexane, which is actually more than 109 degrees. So to get as close to 109 degrees as possible, it adopts something called the chair conformation. And don't worry if you hate the chair conformation, everybody does. 
So uh, I'm going to skip over that. So here are all the different like forms that cyclohexane can take. Uh, don't worry about these too much. We're only really going to be focused on the chair conformations. Okay, so here's the general anatomy of a chair conformation. So I'm going to count the carbons real quick. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is a cyclohexane. Now each one of these carbons is going to either be up or down depending on its position in the ring. Okay, so what I mean by that is in reference to the other carbons, is it going to be slightly up or slightly down? So let's look at carbon three right here. When compared to two and four, this one is slightly up, so we're going to ha have three be an up carbon. Now two is slightly down when compared to one and three, so it's going to be down, and then one is going to be up, and it just alternates around the ring. Okay, okay. So this is important when we talk about the substituents on those carbons. So each one of these carbons can have two substituents, and those substituents can either be axial and equatorial and up or down, okay? So let's take one as an example. One is an up carbon, and it has an up axial, which means it's pointing straight up, and a down equatorial, which means it's pointing down to the side. When we look at two, we notice that they have a down axial, which means they have something pointing straight down, and an up equatorial, which means they have something pointing up and to the side, okay? And notice something about this. One is an up carbon, and their axial is up. Two is a down carbon, and their axial is down. And this, uh, so every single axial is going to match the carbon that they're on. So if you're on an up carbon, you're gonna have an up axial. If you're on a down carbon, you're gonna have a down axial. And it's the opposite for equatorial. If you're on an up carbon, you're gonna have a down equatorial. If you're on a down carbon, you're gonna have an up equatorial, okay? So this is how uh, substituents are put on a ring uh, conformation. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Oh, and every single one of those carbons is gonna have an axial or and equatorial and one up and one down, okay? So now let's talk about ring flipping. So all ring flip, okay, so I know the book goes into really, really uh, excruciating detail about the ring flip, but the way that I think about it is that every single carbon is just gonna be rotated one space, either clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, so somebody asked in the chat, so axial's always up and equatorial's always to the side. Um, so axial's always either straight up or straight down, so like if we go back to this thing here, the red, hydrogens are going to be axial, so it's either straight up or straight down, and the equatorial, which are the blue carbons, are always going to be off to the side, which means they're going to either be off to the side and slightly up or off to the side and slightly down, okay? So the, so axial can be up and down, equatorial can be up or down. It just depends on what kind of carbon that you're on, okay? Okay, uh, let me clear that. Yep, no problem. And so back to the ring flip. Again, we're just rotating over one space. Uh, the down carbons are the ones facing to us. The down carbons are the carbons that are uh, down relative to the other carbons around it. So if we look here, like if we just look at this front bit here, we can see that this, oops, that's white, I wanted blue. Uh, we can see here that this carbon in the middle is up in reference to the carbons next to it, okay? So then this carbon is gonna be up and the carbons next to it are gonna be down, okay? And then you just alternate the up and down around the ring. So if this carbon is down, then the carbon next to it is gonna be up and the carbon next to that is gonna be down and so on. Yes, I prefer looking in the middle because I always found that easiest to see if that was up or down. Usually it's gonna be up, okay? So back to the ring flip. So ring flip, all it does, it shifts one carbon, either, one space, either clockwise or counterclockwise. In this case, it shifts them clockwise. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to number these carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. And what the ring flip does, it moves the one carbon right here. It moves the two carbon here, the three carbon here, four, five, six. So everything shifted one position clockwise, okay? 
And so now what we can do is we can note what happens to the substituents. So let's look at the substituents on one. Here we have an up axial, okay? And then when we go to the rot then with them and then when we go to the ring flip, we can see here that now it's up equatorial. What's important to note here is that it stayed up. Whenever you do a ring flip, your substituents are gonna either stay up or stay down. But also notice that it went from axial to equatorial. So it's going to stay up or stay down, but swap its axial or equatorial. And this is because, notice here, this one carbon was up, okay? But then it shifts over one space and becomes a down carbon. So its axial is no longer gonna be up. And so whatever substituent that was in the up position is gonna be forced into an equatorial position. I know this is sort of hard to understand, but uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna do a quick example uh, and hopefully that'll be better. And please don't judge my uh, ring drawing, uh, my chair drawing because nobody can draw chairs. Okay, there's one and then our ring flip is gonna be, and somebody asked in the, in the chat, if it were to rotate twice, would it stay the same axial or equatorial? Yes, it would. Basically rotating twice would be doing two ring flips in the same direction. But uh, generally, you're only gonna have to do one ring flip because the one ring flip will show the two possible positions for the substituents. And that'll become more important later. So let's look at this ring flip right here. So let's say that we had a uh, chlorine here and a uh, bromine here, okay? When we do the ring flip, I'm gonna flip everything uh, clockwise. When we do the ring flip, uh, our chlorine is going to move from this carbon to this carbon, and then our bromine is going to move from this carbon to this carbon, okay? And so we can see here in our initial ring, the chlorine was up and axial. Now what's gonna happen, it's going to stay up, but it's gonna become equatorial. Okay, so it's not straight up, it's off to the side and up. Yes, I'm gonna show the counterclockwise as well. And then you can see here the bromine was down. So it's going to stay down, but now it's gonna be equatorial. And yes, trust me, that's down equatorial. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Drawing the chair confirmations is truly a pain. Now, somebody in the chat asked, what would happen if we did in the counterclockwise position? So it would sort of be the same thing. So the chlorine would go from this carbon here to this carbon here, and the bromine would go from this carbon here to this carbon here. So they're still right next to each other, and they're still gonna swap from axial, in chlorine's case, axial up, to equatorial up, okay? And then the bromine is going to swap from axial down to equatorial down. So notice here how um, both of these swapped and put both the substituents on equatorial. That means that they're sort of this, they're gonna have the same energy, which helps us determine which one's gonna be more stable. And if a multiple choice question you have has two possible answers, how do you determine which one's the better one? Uh, I don't think that he would do that. Uh, there is no quote unquote better ring flip. So there's only gonna be one of these be the answer. And somebody asked, so an axial become an up equatorial, axial and equatorial swap, but it all stays up. Yes, exactly. So you see here, chlorine swaps from axial to equatorial, but stays up. Bromine swaps from axial and equatorial as well, but stays down, okay? So it keeps its up or down position, but swaps axial and equatorial. And this becomes more important when determining the stabilities of two different ring structures, okay? Which is what I'm gonna get into next. So here we see a monosubstituted cyclohexane. All this means is we have one substituent on our cyclohexane. So if we were to drawing it in just the regular form, it would look like, this or something, okay? And so in this case, we have two different forms. This is a ring flip here, a ring flip. Notice how this carbon with the substituent became this carbon. So we just shifted everything over one clockwise, okay? And so we can see here, this substituent was up axial and became up equatorial. 
which one of these is more stable? Well, you can probably see in the, in the, uh, in the PowerPoint that the one that has an equatorial is more stable, but the question is why? Well, the reason is, is when you're in the equatorial position, you have more room to sort of stretch out. However, when you're in the up position, you have less room and you're gonna see some of that steric strain. So you can see here in this drawing right here, that when you have a big molecule in the up position, it's going to try and push these other smaller molecules out of the way. However, if it were in the, uh, in the axial or the equatorial position rather, like it was down here, then that big electron or that big size is not going to bother the hydrogens over here, okay? And it won't bother the hydrogens off to the side as much either, just because there's more room overall. Now, how do you tell which one's more stable if you have two substitu substituents? So let's say that we had a substituent right uh, here and it was up equatorial. So when we did a ring flip, it would move from this carbon to this carbon, just one over clockwise, and it would stay up, but it becomes up axial. How do we determine which one of these is more stable? Well, if both substituents are exactly the same, they're, then they're gonna have the same energies and be the same stabilities, okay? However, if one of these groups is bigger than the other, so like let's say that this red group here is CH3, and then this black group here is CH2, CH3, which one is more stable now? Well, the more stable one is gonna put the bigger group in the equatorial position. So that means that this one is our more stable cyclohexane ring flip confirmation. Okay, uh, I hope that all makes sense. And then now what we're gonna do is we're gonna be talking about cis or trans isomerism. So these isomers are a little bit different from the ones that we've seen before because the isomers that we've seen before were isomers that, that uh, differed in the actual bonds that they made. Cis trans isomerism is just ha is the difference between molecules in space. And this is something called stereochemistry that we will go into more in later chapters. Don't worry about it right now. So when they're cis, cis uh, has an S sound. So I remember cis means same side. Okay. And then trans, Trans is just the other one. Trans means opposite sides, okay? So when you're cis, you're either both up. Oh, uh, somebody asked in the, in the chat. So just to, just to confirm, bigger groups in the equatorial position are more stable than if they were in the axial position? Yes. And Nosley asked, will he make us do a nomenclature problem with cis or trans? No, that will come into play in the next couple chapters. The, the only name that you should worry about are, is the just the regular alkanes that you learned earlier, okay? Okay, so let's clear this. You can see here in this cis uh, example, both of them are up, but this would still be cis if both of them were down. It just depends on your preference. What I always like to do is if I were drawing the chair confirmation and I had two solid wedges, I like to draw them as up. Because I, and then uh, if we have dashed wedges, I like to always draw them as down because I found that it was helpful for me to have just like a rule for myself so I can remember exactly where everything goes. And so let's look here. So if we were, one question that may have to do with this type of problem, he would just give you these two pictures at the bottom, so these two, and then he would ask you which one is more stable. And so what this question does is it forces you to draw the uh, chair conformation and it forces you to have to understand what makes a chair conformation more stable. Now in this case, this guy is gonna be more stable because one of its ring flips uh, will be, and then after this ex explanation, I'll explain when something is neither cis nor trans. Uh, so again, this one is gonna be more stable because it has a possible ring flip structure where everything is equatorial, okay? Whereas in this case, none of the times are you ever gonna have both of them in equatorial, only one of them can be equatorial at a time. So if you had a question like this, you would have to draw out um, the whole problem. Uh, when something is neither equatorial nor, uh, I mean, sorry, neither cis nor trans, that'd be something like, uh, I'm gonna pull up the worksheet here, um, that would be something like uh, this guy right here in the middle. And this is because both of the substituents are on the same carbon. And remember how we talked about earlier that sp3 carbons 
like to have two lines where we can see here, one solid dash and one, and one, um, one solid wedge and one dashed wedge, okay? You can never have two solid wedges or two dashed wedges on the same carbon. So you can't exactly call this cis or trans just because they're on the same carbon, okay? Does that make sense? Um, let me go back to the... Okay, perfect. And so let, let's do an example of this problem that I said before. If I were like, okay, so if I have this guy here, um, and it had a solid wedge here, dashed wedge here, and this guy here, I had a solid wedge here and a solid wedge here. And I asked you which one is more stable. You cannot tell which one of these is more stable without drawing the chair confirmation. So I'm going to also teach you how to draw chair confirmation. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to continue on with this. Okay, so somebody in the chat asked, uh, but if in the first picture, if they are both axial, won't they both become equatorial? Well, if you look here, uh, one is axial and one is equatorial. And that's always going to happen. That's always how it's going to be because when you do a ring flip, the equatorial will become axial and the axial will become equatorial and you'll never have both of them as equatorial. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to continue on. And so this is sort of how you draw a chair confirmation. What I like to do is I like to take my cyclohexane and I like to number it. So one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. In this case, it doesn't really matter how you number it because this numbering isn't for naming. It's more for your own uh, process of putting things on the chair confirmation. So I'm gonna do the same thing over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'm just gonna number this chair confirmation. One, two, three, four, five, six. And here we see on two, we have a solid wedge. And like I said, I like to make solid wedges up. You don't have to, but I'm going to. So if we look here, two is a down carbon. Because if we look here, three is an up carbon because the other two carbons around it are relatively down. So two has to be a down carbon, and on a down carbon, we can't have an up axial, so we have to make this up equatorial, okay? And so the next, we're gonna look at four, and the same thing, we're on a down carbon, so we have to make it an up equatorial, okay? So there's our first, um, there's our first uh, cyclohexane ring confirmation. And so let's look over here now, one, two, three, four, five, six. If we look at, so again, we're on two, and it's going to be up equatorial. However, now we're on four. And again, I say I like to make dashed wedges down. So here, for example, we're on a down carbon, so we're going to make a down axial, okay? And so if you look here, this guy has two, uh, two substituents in the equatorial position, whereas this one only has one. So this guy is going to be more stable, okay? So what is stopping me from making them both axial in the cis one? Uh, so it, it just depends on where I place them on the molecule. So for example, if instead of saying I want them both to be up, I said I want them both to be down, then I would do the same thing, except on two and four, I would make them both axial down. Still, this guy is going to be more stable because if I do a ring clip, both of them are going to become equatorial and therefore they're going to be, be more stable overall. And somebody asked in the, chat, in the chat, so dashes mean down and wedge up. It doesn't matter, honestly, as long as it's, uh, as long as it's a um, consistent way for you. Like I said, I like to make solid wedges up and dashed wedges down because I find it easier if I have a, uh, if I have a, a, definitive way to do them. So like, let's see, for example, um, let's say they gave you a chair confirmation and they're like, draw this in the cyclohexane confirmation. And so let's say we have um, this guy here and then this guy here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw just a cyclohexane and I'm gonna number it just like I did before. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then one, two, three, four, five, now using my naming, now using my conventions, I would say one has a dashed wedge and three has a solid wedge, but you don't have to do it that way. This is just what I found makes it easiest for me if I stay consistent. So I'm going to say one is a dashed wedge and three is a solid wedge. 
it would be just as valid to say that one is a solid wedge and three is a dashed wedge, okay? It just depends on your preference. Like I said, I like to have a more set in stone naming convention or a set in stone uh, convention for this stuff just so it's easier for me to keep things in line, okay? Okay, so now let's continue on. And so again, we talked about this earlier, di substituted uh, cyclohexanes. You put the larger, the larger substituent in the equatorial position. Um, and yeah, and I think that's about the, so chapter four ends with a discussion on the combustion of alkanes. This has to do with oxidation reduction, which is not going to be explored much on this test. The only thing that you would ever be asked about it, oh, uh, why is wedge on the fourth axial? Uh, like I said, Victor, um, I don't, like, like I said, you don't have to go by the rule that I said, where the up is the solid wedge and down is the dashed wedge. That's just how I like to remember to make sure that I have my solids and my solid wedges and my dashed wedges on different planes. Um, and are we gonna talk about the naming from chapter four? Yes, I just wanted to get through the, um, like the end of chapter four, just to make sure that we can, uh, that we hit the most um, trouble spots that people have. So um, when we're talking about uh, combustion of alkanes, what we're really talking about is oxidation and reduction of alkanes. Again, this isn't gonna be explored much on this test. It will be explored in later chapters that are dedicated to oxidation and reduction, okay? So, but the general rule is, is that oxidation means that there's an increase in carbon oxygen bonds or a decrease in carbon hydrogen bonds. So if we look here, um, if we look here, uh, we can see here that we start with this thing here. This thing is full of CH bonds, but then we break all of them to make more CO bonds. So CH bonds went down and CO bonds went up. So this was oxidized, okay? Now, re now this is confusing because it says this guy was reduced, which, but that's because it's sort of thinking about it in the opposite direction as well. Reduction, what reduction means, it means a decrease in carbon oxygen bonds or an increase in carbon hydrogen bonds. So if we went from CO2 to 224 trimethyl pentane, then our, all of our carbon oxygen bonds are going down and our carbon hydrogen bonds are going up. So that means that if we were going this way, this would be reduction. And again, this is not focused much in this, these these chapters in this test because there's a whole chapter dedicated to it later. So don't be too worried if you don't understand it fully. Okay, so now to talk about naming. Naming honestly is not as hard as it seems and I'm going to use the worksheet that we went out over in class to do it. So the way that I generally do it is I go first, I look for the parent chain. And then two, I look for my substituents, which I'm gonna put sub and three, I number my substituents, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look for a parent chain, which means we're gonna look for the longest carbon chain that is possible. And also that carbon chain cannot go through a cyclo unless the parent chain is that cyclo. For, so for example, with this guy right here, we can't have a parent chain that looks like this because that goes through the cyclo without actually being the cyclo, okay? So let's go back to my other example here. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna find the parent chain. So we're just gonna find the longest possible chain. And what I like to do, I like to um, like sort of draw them out, like highlight them and then number them and see which one had the highest number. So like uh, for the second one right here, we'll do the second one real quick just to exhibit how the parent chain is not always what it seems. We could have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the pink line would be eight, or we could have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the orange line is nine. So you see here how the orange line has is the parent chain because it's a longer continuous chain of carbons, even though it looks like eight would be a nicer parent chain. So in this case, our parent chain is right here. I'm just gonna highlight it, and there we go. So our parent name is going to be nonane because that, so the root word for nine is non, and we're making a parent chain, we're gonna end it with ane, so non-name, okay? 
And so now what we're going to do is we're going to find the substituents. So here's one substituent here, and here's one substituent here. If you don't know what this substituent is, that's fine. I'm going to go over all the special substituents in a moment, okay? So now we found the substituents, and I know their names because I've been doing this for a while, but this substituent is methyl, and this substituent is isopropyl. Okay, so now we've found our substituents, and to name your substituents, you take the, uh, the root name, so like one carbon is going to be meth, and then you're going to add ill to the end of it, so methyl, okay? And so now what we do is we're going to number our parent chain. The way that I always like to do this, I like to number it one way and then the opposite way. So what I mean by that is I'm going to number it first, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nine from left to right, and then I'm going to do the exact opposite and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so for the top version, we can put our substituents on six and three, or let me do that the other way. So we can put it on three and six, and for the bottom version, we can put them on four and seven. Now remember, we try to give our substituents the lowest number possible, so three and six is going to be preferred over four and seven, okay? So we're going to have four dash methyl, or not four dash methyl, sorry, uh, three dash methyl and six dash isopropyl, okay? And we also want to make sure that we're putting this in alphabetical order in the actual name, okay? So I comes before N in the alphabet, so that's why we're going to put isopropyl before methyl. And so the full name here would be 6-isopropyl dash, because we're going to put dashes between letters and numbers, 3-methyl and noname. Okay, does that make sense as far as naming goes? And I'm gonna teach you the special substituents in just a second. Why would six isopropyl come first? That's a good question. That's because when we're putting the substituents in the actual name, we wanna go by alphabetical order. So I comes before M in the alphabet, so we're gonna start with six isopropyl and then go to three methyl, okay? And uh, what's important to note is if you have stuff like di, so like if you had two methyls, you would say dimethyl, the di does not have anything to do with the uh, alphabet, but here in this example, iso, the i does, because isopropyl is a different type of substituent, okay? So I'm gonna show you the special uh, substituents now. Uh, I don't think he would ask you too many questions where the special substituents are present, but I still wanna make sure that you guys know them. So I, let's start with isopropyl and propyl, okay? Is isopropyl the only exception to that rule, or does it apply to isobutyl? Yes. So the rule where isopropyl is considered alphabetical with I is with secbutyl, isobutyl, and tertbutyl as well, which we are going to be talking about like right now. Okay, but the first thing I want to go over is uh, propyl versus secpropyl. I mean, sorry, sec, isopropyl. So propyl, if it were just a regular propyl, would look like this. So it's going to be one, two, three, uh, sorry, one, two, three. Where we have one carbon here, one carbon here, one carbon here. Isopropyl, on the other hand, makes it so this carbon here is the one that's attached to the parent chain. So one, two, three, okay? So this is propyl, and this is isopropyl. And the way that I think about this is, is this guy here is an isomer of propyl. So it's called isopropyl. And somebody read there, or somebody said in the chat that, sh that they read somewhere that it was just anything with iso. It's also going to be sec and tert because it's actually describing the physical shape of the uh, substituent rather than with the di, tri, tetra sort of thing. That describes the number, okay? So here are the two, like, funny propyls that you have to memorize. So the next one we're going to be talking about is butyl. So a regular butyl is just four carbons connected to the parent chain. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So this is butyl. Okay, but what if we're connected in different ways? So if we're connected to the secondary carbon, so this one right here, then we're called sec butyl because this carbon 
is attached to two other carbons, so it's secondary, it's sec butyl, okay? And so then, let me change color, so this is sec butyl. What is square count as butyl? Um, we'll get into that in a second, but a square that looks like this, this would be cyclobutyl, okay? Okay, um, so let's continue on, and I'm gonna move this stuff over, okay? And so the next type of butyl, but, the next type of butyl that we have to look out for is something called isobutyl. And this one's sort of easy to remember because it's a lot, it's very similar to the isopropyl, except it has one extra carbon. So one, two, three, four. So it looks a lot like isopropyl, but now it has an extra carbon that it's attached to. So this is isobutyl, okay? And then the final special butyl is going to be tert butyl where we have, let me change my color, we have one carbon right here and then one, two, three. So it's connected to three other carbons. It's called tert. It's a tertiary carbon, so it's tert butyl, okay? Again, I don't expect many of these be, uh, to be on your test for naming because they are kind of advanced. Uh, I, you would more likely see them later in the year, uh, later in the semester rather, or in Orgo too but I would know what they are for like stuff like maybe there's a bonus question that talks about isobutyl, tert-butyl, all that stuff, okay? And so now uh, let's do one more naming example real quick. So let's look at this guy right here. Like I said before, we wanna find the longest carbon chain. Oh, uh, so Sophia, uh, somebody in the chat asked, so if you have methyl and tert-butyl, methyl would go first or do you go off with a b and butyl you're gonna methyl would go first because again remember that tert uh, iso and sec are changing the actual structure like the actual structural information about what we have whereas di tri and um and tetra and stuff like that doesn't change our actual uh structure at least that's what i've been taught okay um, okay, clear my drawings. So now let's look at this guy right here. To find the longest carbon chain, uh, you might be tempted to try and go through the uh, cyclo in the middle, but again, you can't do that. Your longest continuous carbon chain can't intersect a cyclo unless it is actually the cyclo. So if we look here, we have one, two, three, four, and that's going to be our longest carbon chain. So our parent name is going to be cyclobutane. And if we look at our substituents here, we have one, two, three, four ethyls. So it'll be four ethyl. And then we, or I'm sorry, not four ethyl, uh, tetra, tetra ethyl. Tetra ethyl, because tetra means four. And then we have one methyl here. So we're just gonna be regular old methyl. Okay? So now we have to try and number this thing, but it's a little bit tricky to know where to number it. You want to number it so you give the most substituents the lowest name possible or the lowest number possible. So we're going to start one at the bottom because we'll give two ethyls one. Okay. And then we're just going to go, you can go either way. You can go this way, two, three, four, or the other way. I, I just went that way because I felt like it. So our name here is going to be uh, one, one, because we have two ethyls on one, two, four, tetraethyl, because we have four ethyls, dash three, dash methyl, I'm going to run out of room, cyclobutane. I did it. Okay. Does that all make sense to everybody? I hope it does, because I'm about to, I'm about to move on. <laughs> okay, and so like the final thing that you might be asked to do with a uh, drawing is um, is they give you a name and then you'll have to figure out what that name means. The way that I like to do this is sort of like the same uh, the same order that I like to do uh, naming it when I'm given a structure. I start with the parent chain. So in this case, that would be octane or over here would be hexane and I draw that first. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and hexane, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? And then I look at the substituents. I'm gonna have a, a, two, a two, four dimethyl. So that means I'm gonna have a methyl, or a methyl on two and a methyl on four. And so what I like to do is I like to number my carbon. So one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. This also makes sure that you gave your chain the, the right number of carbons. And so now I'm gonna put methyl on two and four. So one methyl here and one methyl here, okay? And then down here, I have a three cyclopentyl. So that all that means is I'm gonna put a cyclopentyl on three. So it just looks like this, okay? And so finally, uh, on this first one here, we're gonna see three ethyl. So all that means is I'm gonna put an ethyl on three, which is right here. And you may be asking, why did I do that ethyl down and the methyls up? That's just sort of uh, how you draw it to give yourself the most room possible. It wouldn't technically be incorrect to put your ethyl like uh, right here, but it just, it, it just looks better and it's easier to draw when you do it this, okay? Okay, so that's done with chapter four. Uh, I'll go ahead and open the, uh, the Florida questions. Other than that, I'm just gonna sort of run through all of the, uh, the questions that, the hardest questions that I think that you might see. Okay, so somebody in the question asked, so ethyl has two carbons and propyl has three. Uh, yes, there is a chart in chapter four that tells you most of, or all of the uh, numbers that you're gonna need. Honestly, I wouldn't memorize uh, past 10. Like, this is plenty. Okay, so it's methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane. And you'll be able to, you'll be able to lift that, list that off by the end of this class. Okay? I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, it's in regarding to hybridization, though. Okay, that's so fine. For um, H2O, in the O, would it be sp3? So I'm confused. Do you count the lone pairs as one group each? Okay. Or just the group? So yeah. this is a really good question because I don't think we went over this much in class. Hybridization. What, what exactly does it mean? So sp, sp2, and sp3 are what we're going to be using in this class. And each one of these means it tells us how many electron groups are around an atom. It doesn't have to be carbon, but we're mostly gonna be dealing with carbon in this class. So looking at here, SP is gonna have two electron groups. And I like to remember this as you have one S plus one P equals two electron groups. SP, SP2 is gonna have three electron groups, and SP3 is gonna have four electron groups. And this holds true for any atom, okay? So let's look at H2O, like you said. So H, O, H. This oxygen has, uh, let me get my highlighter, one, two, three, four groups. Each lone pair uh, acts as a one group un unto of itself. So this guy is going to be sp3, okay? On the other hand, what if we had an oxygen double bonded to, I don't know, a carbon? It doesn't matter. We're looking at the oxygen right now. This oxygen now only has one, two, three groups because double and triple bonds act as one group. So this guy is going to be sp2, okay? Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this, and I'm going to actually do uh, the type of question that you would probably, like the hardest question you would probably see on hybridization. So I'm just going to make up something right here. Um, yeah, this, will, this can be H and then. So a question like this, it could ask you what orbitals make up this bond right here. And to answer that question, all you do is you look at the orbitals for each atom that makes up that bond. So in this case, this carbon right here, which is going to be a carbon triple bonded to something, single bonded to hydrogen, so it has two electron groups around it. So it's gonna be sp and then h. h always has an orbital of one s. And there are different ways you can write this bond. You can write it sp one s, or you can write it csp to uh, h one s. This is a little bit more, um, uh, this is the, like, I guess, quote unquote, correct. Like this is a little bit more specific, but, um, this this should be fine for like what your purposes are. And somebody in the chat asked, is he gonna ask about hybridization geometry like the oxygen H2O is bent? No, this is probably the uh, furthest that he'll ask for, um, for hybridization. And so let's do one more example of this. What is the hybridization of that bond right there? Well, what we have to do, we look at these carbons. 
And remember that for every single carbon on a line angle structure, there are enough hydrogens on it to fill in its octet as long as it, um, it does not have a charge. So this guy has an H here, this guy has an H here. So both of these carbons are gonna be sp2 hybridized. And so then this bond is gonna be CSP2, CSP2, or just sp2, sp2. Okay, so somebody asked in the chat, can you do an isomer stereo isomer resonance question, like deciding what a structure would be? Okay, so let me clear my drawings real quick. And let me just make up something just real quick. So let's say we had um, this guy, um, uh, this, uh, hold on. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to think. Um, this guy, and then um, this guy. Um, I think that's right. No, wait, right here. Okay, so this is just going to be a resonant structure versus isomer question. Uh, stereo isomers, you don't have to worry about too much right now. Uh, this is probably the extent of like the isomer type questions that you'll get. So it's like, tell me if these are, so like, tell me if this is an isomer of this, or if this is an isomer of this. So notice here how um, this OH was not here before. Okay. So, and then notice here how we now have a double bond to this carbon. If we fill in the hydrogens for the uh, carbons here, we can see here that this guy has two carbons, but this carbon over here has three hydrogens. Sorry, I misspoke. This guy has two hydrogens, not two carbons. Two hydrogens, and this guy has three hydrogens. So what happened here is that one of the three hydrogens over here was transferred onto this oxygen which made a different, a new and different bond, which means that these are isomers and not uh, resonance structures, okay? Here on the other hand, oops, here on the other hand, all of the single bonds are the same. The only thing that changed was this double bond and this negative charge. So what happened here? So essentially this oxygen had six free electrons this oxygen had two free electrons. Since that oxygen had six free electrons, it was able to make a new bond between this carbon right here. However, again, that carbon can't be have more than five bonds. So this double bond here has to break and go onto this oxygen, which makes this oxygen have six electrons and be negatively charged, okay? And again, uh, stereoisomers later in the book, I wouldn't worry about it too much right now, uh, the only quote unquote stereo isomers that you'll see are like cyclohexanes. And again, you won't get too many questions on those that aren't about ring or chair conformations. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, which ones are isomers? Oh, um, these two are isomers. These two are, I'm sorry. These two are isomers. These two are resonant structures. And somebody asked, I know that resonance never move atoms, but it's hard to decide when the charge will move. I always have a problem with the charges. Yes, yeah, okay, so the way that I always did these, like when I was first getting back into resonance structures and stuff, is I would always sort of draw out all of my hydrogens. So like here, it's easy to see, oh, I had three hydrogens here, and then two hydrogens here, something changed, those are isomers. And then uh, generally uh, seeing Resonant structures is gonna be uh, just like a skill that you gain in this class, honestly. But if you see, look, check out this carbon right here. This carbon is sp2 hybridized, which means it can have a double bond anywhere. It does not care where its double bond is as long as it has a double bond. So you can see here in this first structure, the double bond is to this top oxygen, okay? And then it moves to this side oxygen. Again, that carbon in the middle is sp2, so it can hold a double bond, which is the whole reason why we can move a, a, a lone pair from this oxygen to that bond and break a double bond right here, okay? Um, honestly, if you see a carbon that has a double bond, 
that double bond can sort of rotate around that carbon as long as the atoms next to it can hold a double bond, if that makes sense. And again, resonant structures, it's sort of practice makes perfect and uh, you'll be able to see it a little bit better again once you do a little bit more practice and you go through this class. Like I can automatically see resonant structures now, which I don't know if that's a good or a bad skill. <laughs> Maybe a good skill for chemistry, a bad skill for real life, okay? So uh, somebody in the chat said, Alex showed structures where the charge sometimes would go to a carbon and sometimes it would not. Um, I don't know what that means, but generally uh, a carbon, uh, yes, Alex is whack, but generally a carbon that has a three bonds, so it has three bonds and no lone pair is going to be positively charged because it has to do with the formal charge. Because the formal charge for this type of carbon is going to be four valence electrons minus three bonds minus zero electrons and lone pairs. So it's going to be plus one. So it has a space for an additional bond. And in addition, this is sp2. Okay? However, on the other hand, we have this type of carbon where it has three bonds and a lone pair. And it's going to be negatively charged because of its uh, formal charge. So it's going to be uh, 4 minus 3 minus 2 equals negative 1. And notice here that this guy is sp3 hybridized. However, by using its electrons here, it can make a new bond. Okay, so that's why these two types of carbons can make new bonds, but for different reasons. This guy on the left, it can accept a new bond. This guy on the right can make a new bond. Uh, somebody asked, can you explain why if carbon is bonded to another carbon or a hydrogen, it's nucleophilic? Like it has to be bo bonded to another atom besides those to be electrophilic, right? Um, so this question, again, has to do with later chapters. And what this question is sort of asking about, it's asking about Lewis acids and Lewis bases, which is the first time that we hear the words nucleophilic and electrophilic. So. Lewis acids, they accept, or they, um, they accept electrons, so they love electrons. Lewis bases don't need electrons, so they hate electrons, okay? So we can also think of these as electron-loving, electrophilic. And then when you hate electrons, you want more protons, which are in the nucleus. So this is going to be nucleophilic. Oh, I totally did not write the rest of that word, but you know what I mean, okay? And so can you, I don't know what you're exactly asking when you say if a carbon is bonded to another carbon or oxygen or hydrogen, it's a nucleophilic. Um, usually when something has a, a positive charge or a partial positive charge, it's going to love electrons and be electrophilic. Usually when something has a negative charge or a partial negative charge or available lone pairs, it's going to be nucleophilic, okay? So like, let's see an example, um, OH negative, it has extra electrons, it loves positive charges, so it's gonna be nucleophilic. And then let's say we had CH3 plus, again, that has a positive charge, so it's gonna be electrophilic, and the positive charge comes from its formal charge, not because it's bound to other hydrogens. So what happens here is the electrophile and the nucleophile marry, and we get COH, uh, oops, my pen is winging out, COH and then CH3. Okay, did that help answer your question at least a little bit? Um, what if CH3 had no positive charge? So CH3 can't not have a charge. What you're thinking about probably is, um, like if we had H2O, which means O is neutrally charged, but it also has available lone pairs. So it can make a new bond. However, CH4 cannot make a new bond because it has no lone pairs and no available space for new electrons to go. Because again, we can't violate the octet rule. So this CH4 has eight electrons around it. And so it can't gain another bond without violating the octet rule and getting 10 electrons. Okay, does that make sense? I think it does. And okay, I think I might have to finish up. But if you guys have any last minute questions, I am happy to answer them. Just let me know. Um, I know we didn't go over chapter two and chapter three too in depth, but the base of uh, chapter three, uh, the most important part, in my opinion, is how the interim molecular forces affect 
solubility for one, and boiling point. Uh, can you go over acid-base reactions? That is a um, that is a big question, but I will. So, uh, what do you mean acid-base reactions? Do you want me to go over what makes an acid strong and what makes an acid weak, or do you want to go over like how the arrows move or how the electrons move in an acid-base reaction? Because those are two very different things. Um, I'll give you a second to answer that. Okay, so weak and strong. Uh, and somebody else asked, can you show us which functional groups we should have memorized? Uh, honestly, I don't, I wouldn't say have too many of these functional groups memorized. This, this is a quicker answer. This is a quicker question to answer. So I'm going to answer this one real quick and then go back to the acid base thing. So uh, can you show us which functional groups we should have memorized? Honestly, um, I wouldn't memorize any of them. Um, the only ones that I would really think about memorizing are the aldehyde, the ketone, and the carboxylic acid because um, those are pretty similar. Uh, the hardest question that I can think he would ask is he would give you a molecule and ask you to name the, uh, the groups in it, but I don't, he doesn't really like doing those questions too much. So like an aldehyde would be a carbon double bond to an oxygen with a hydrogen. And I think of aldehyde because it has an H in it. So it has an H there. Yeah, it's a little stupid. And then a carboxylic acid, to be an acid, you have to have an H bond somewhere, so it has OH. And then a ketone, um, I don't really have a fun way of memorizing this one. It's just sort of a, a ketone has stuff on either side of it. Okay, so like those are sort of like the big three, I would say, and maybe alcohols. A ketone looks like a key. Oh my god, you're a genius. Nazi said a ketone looks like a key. Wow, that's so smart. Okay, anyways, so um, uh, in addition, maybe memorize alcohols because alcohols specifically have an OH group bonded to a sp3 carbon specifically. Because remember, an sp2 carbon has a double bond. So it'd be like, if you had this, this wouldn't be a uh, this wouldn't be a alcohol. This would be a carboxylic acid. So it just depends on what you have. And again, he's I don't think he's gonna hammer too hard on the functional groups. He's gonna be more worried about uh, intermolecular forces and solubility and uh, boiling point rules. Okay, so let's quickly go over what makes an acid strong or weak. So essentially what we're gonna go over is something called REO, where each one of these letters have to do with something uh, with the, uh, that have to do something with the acid. So A stands for atom or element. Um, so Victor in the, in the chat asked, do you have tips about acid bases strength based on the format, like how stable they are. So essentially, the more stable a conjugate base is, the more, the stronger an acid is. Because when you have an acid, essentially what happens is it falls apart into H plus and its conjugate base. So the more stable this conjugate base is, the more likely this HA will fall apart into it. All right, let me take a sip of water real quick. Did I answer your question? Okay. Okay, cool. So, so the first thing in ARIO is going to be the atom that the hydrogen is directly attached to. This is only the atom that's directly attached to. So if I have OH or C double bond OH, I would be comparing the C and the O, not the two oxygens. So it's only the atom that's directly bonded to the hydrogen. This is important to note. And then the next thing that we're gonna, so we're gonna talk about how the atomic effect uh, affects things. So essentially the atomic effect, me is talking about how well an atom holds on to a negative charge. So again, when you break an acid, so HA, the electrons from that HA bond are gonna go onto that atom. And so then that atom is going to gain a negative charge or lose a positive charge, okay? So it gains an extra lone pair. So the better that atom is at holding that negative charge, the better the acid will be. So the main rule for this is the bigger the uh, atom, the more stable the acid, or the better the acid. And this is because uh, you can think of electrons as like a cup of water, okay? If I pour this cup of water or these electrons into a really small atom or cup, the water is gonna spill out everywhere Whereas if I put the electrons or the water in a really big bucket, it's gonna be able to hold those electrons really, really well. And so that's why the bigger the atom that's connected to the hydrogen, the stronger your base is going to be. 
And um, somebody asked, uh, but the more electronegative atoms are the smaller ones, right? Uh, yes, the more electronegative atoms tend to be the smaller ones uh, because of PR trends. So when we're talking about strong or a bigger in general, we're talking about when we're going down a column. So when we're comparing um, oxygen, oops, we're comparing like oxygen versus sulfur. We're going down a column there. And since sulfur is bigger, sulfur is going to be better at being an acid. So like if we're comparing H2O and H2S, so H, H2O versus h 2 oh, that's not an S, S. H2S is going to be the stronger acid because sulfur is bigger, okay? But then if the atoms are in the same rows, then we compare electronegativity. The more electronegative an atom is, the more it loves electrons and the better it will hold on to a negative charge. So let's say we're comparing oxygen versus nitrogen. They're both similar sizes, but oxygen is more electronegative, so it's going to be the stronger acid, okay? And so the atomic effect is the first thing you're going to look at, and it's the most important thing, okay? So this is the thing you're going to look at first. But what if the atoms are the same thing? So like if I have an OH on one molecule and an OH on another molecule, those atoms are the exact same thing. So now I have to look at their resonance. So the more resonance that something has, the more delocalized the electrons on that molecule will be. Because essentially when you have a resonance structure, so I'm going to do um, this guy right here. When you have a resonance structure, you don't have two individual structures that exist in space. Oh, I shouldn't have that negative charge right there. Um, essentially, you don't have two different structures that exist in space. You have something that's called a hybrid of it, which looks more like this. Um, so that each oxygen is gonna have the partial negative charge, and that negative charge is not localized on any one atom. And as a result, it's delocalized across the molecule and is made more, and the molecule or the conjugate base is made more stable. So what resonance means is resonance causes electrons to be delocalized on a conjugate base and therefore stabilize that conjugate base and makes the acid stronger. So essentially the more resonance structures you have, the better. So let's say for example, you have two resonance structures on one acid and three on another. The one with three resonance structures is going to be the stronger acid. Um, you said my, you hear my voice a little weird. Um, is everyone else okay? Okay, so everyone else is okay. So the more times it moves the charge, the better. Yes, exactly. Okay, so my voice is okay, good. So the more times it can move the charge, the better, because that means the more chances it has at delocalizing its charge, okay? So you look at, you look at the atomic effects, you look at the resonance effects, they're both the same. The next thing you're gonna look at is the inductive effect. So the inductive effect is like uh, the poor man's resonance effect because it also delocalizes electrons, but it delocalizes them not as well as the resonance effect. So what happens here? So let's say we have an electronegative atom like F over here and a negatively charged oxygen over here. That F loves electrons, so it's going to do its best to pull electrons towards itself and delocalize the negative charges on the oxygen all across the molecule, okay? And so then that's what the inductive effect does. So if we were to compare uh, the F, the uh, molecule with the F to the molecule with the H, this is going to be the more stable conjugate base and be associated with the stronger acid. So like if you're comparing um, this to this, this is the stronger acid. And then so uh, somebody said, so delocalizing electrons means that electrons are more spread out rather than clustered together. Exactly. That's exactly it. Okay. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying here is that the fluorine or an electronegative atom, it could really be any electronegative atom, pull, it's usually going to be fluorine or bromine, are going to pull electrons towards themselves and delocalize that negative charge all across the molecule of the conjugate base. And somebody asked, would fluorine atom or a bromine have an atom have a better inductive effect? The fluorine atom. So if we're comparing, let's say we're comparing fluorine and bromine, Whichever is more electronegative is going to be do a better job at delocalizing electrons and be a better acid, okay? And then let's say that we're looking at something like, um, instead of that, we're looking at something like 
um, this, where this guy had two fluorines on it. This one would have a better inductive effect because there are more, uh, there, there are more electronegative atoms pulling electrons towards itself. And somebody in the chat asked, if the atom is bigger in size, does that have priority over electronegativity? No, size only has to do with the atomic effects. And does he curve? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> and that's usually because people, some, some, some crackhead is gonna get 100. Ooh, I probably shouldn't have said crackhead. Um, sorry. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, so in addition, if uh, the electronegative atom is closer, so like let's say that we had um, a fluorine two bonds away, this fluorine is going to have a greater inductive effect than this fluorine because this fluorine is farther away, okay? And so then that's generally how the inductive effect works. And so the last thing we're going to look at is the orbitals. So we've looked at atomic effect, we looked at the resonance effect, we looked at the inductive effect, and so now we're going to look at the orbital effect. Usually we're gonna look at the orbital effect in reference to carbons. So essentially what the orbital effect means is the more S character that a bond has, the more, uh, the more acidic it will be. What does this mean? So remember we talked about SP, SP2, and SP3. We can think of this guy here as one half S because you have one S and one P. So you have 50% S. And then here we have one third S because you have one S and two P's, so 33% S. And finally, this is 25% S. So if you, if you have a hydrogen connected to a carbon that has, is SP hybridized, then that will be a stronger acid than something that's connected to, and then a hydrogen that's connected to a carbon that's SP3 hybridized, okay? So um, if I were to have, let's say that I have uh, something like, um, this, um, and I was like, okay, which of these hydrogens is more acidic? You would look at what kind of carbon it's attached to. So this one is attached to an sp2 carbon, this one's attached to an sp3 carbon, and this is attached to an sp carbon. So this hydrogen is going to be the most acidic because it's attached to something with the most S character, okay? And then the next strongest would be the sp2, and then the, the, la the least strong would be sp3. Again, you're uh, mostly going to see orbitals when you're comparing the acidities of carbons, or of hydrogens connected to carbons. Uh, you don't often see it when we're comparing uh, hydrogens connected to other types of atoms, okay? So that's just sort of the rundown with acids and how to tell an acid strength. And one thing to note, a stronger acid makes a weaker base. So if we have an, and then uh, vice versa, a weak acid makes a strong base. And when we're looking at, if we're trying to figure out if something's a stronger base than something else, we're gonna do the opposite of what we did for our acid base rules. So the weak base is the most stable one exactly. So let's look at this guy. So remember how we said that oxygen is electronegative, it can hold a negative charge well? Well, carbon can't hold a negative charge well, so this is gonna be the stronger base because it's more desperate to get rid of that negative charge, okay? So the less stable base is the stronger base, okay? And we're gonna do sort of the opposite of what we did with our uh, acid rules, okay? Does that answer all of your question about acids and everything? Okay. Uh, uh, I have okay. one question real quick. Okay. Um, so how come they say to look at the conjugate base when we have all these things to use for the strength of an acid? Well, because uh, what we're doing with the uh, ARIO, the A-R-I-O, when we're looking at an acid, what we're really doing is we're determining the stability of the conjugate base. Because remember, uh, when we lose the hydrogen, we're going to gain a negative charge. So we're looking at atomic effects. Uh, the bigger atoms like sulfur can hold a negative charge better than a lone oxygen because sulfur is bigger. And so in this case, we're looking at the stability of the conjugate base. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? No, yeah, that answers it. And then uh, for a second thing real quick, when you're saying for the atomic effect, when two atoms are in the same row, what do you look at then? You look at electronegativity. So remember we compared nitrogen versus oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative, so it will be associated with the stronger acid. So let's say we had NH3 
versus H2O. H2O is the stronger acid because oxygen is more electronegative. Okay? Got it. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, so, thanks. What about forces? Um, are you talking about uh, electronegativity forces? The Oh, oh, intermolecular forces. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I didn't even specify. Thank you. Yeah. I, I totally blanked there. Okay, so electroneg or electronegative intermolecular forces. So there are three main types of intermolecular forces that we're worried about here. Van der Waals forces, which also know VDW, which are also known as London dispersion forces, so VDW or LD. Dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding forces. So dipole-dipole DD, hydrogen bonding is HB. And each one of these uh, have a certain intermolecular strength, which means how well can they uh, cause two molecules that are exactly the same to cluster together, okay? So the order that this is goes is that Van der Waals is the least strong, and then dipole-dipole, and then hydrogen bonding is the strongest. So when does Van der Waals take effect? Van der Waals is in every single molecule, okay? But the bigger the molecule, the more prominent the Van der Waals force is, okay? And then dipole-dipole. Dipole-dipole occurs when you have an electronegative atom near a less electronegative atom. So let's look at like water, for example. Oxygen is highly electronegative, especially when compared to hydrogen. So oxygen is going to gain a partially negative charge, and hydrogen is going to gain a partially positive charge, both of these things. So when we're in, if we have like a bucket of water, the partially positive hydrogens will trap the partially negative oxygens of the other water molecules, which causes them to stick together, okay? And finally, there's hydrogen bonding. This occurs if you have an OH, an NH, oops, NH, or an FH bond in your molecule. And this is what holds DNA together. And essentially what goes on here is if you have like two OHs, the oxygen of one OH is going to attract the hydrogen of another and vice versa, okay? And so then each of these uh, determines solubility, or not solubility, the boiling point of something. So the more intermolecular forces that you have, the higher your boiling point is going to be. So let's take um, uh, this first example right here. Yeah, this is fun. Uh, let's take this first example right here. This guy has Van der Waal forces only, okay? Then this guy has Van der Waal forces and dipole-dipole forces because that oxygen there is pulling uh, a negative charge towards itself, making itself partially negative, and making this carbon partially positive. And we can see there that is reflected in their melting and their boiling points. The melting and boiling point of acetone is higher than isobutylene because it has that dipole-dipole force, okay? Uh, and then let's see, uh, I know there's like an example over here. Oh, uh, also the more hydrogen bonding you have, the higher the boiling point because there's more uh, hydrogen bonding and there's more forces between them. And uh, so we can see here that trimethyl, trimethylamine has a boiling point of like 3.5 degrees C, but then when we add one degree of hydrogen bonding, it shoots up to 37 degrees C and then it shoots up to 49 degrees C when we have two degrees of hydrogen bonding, okay? And then let's look at, and then again, like I said before, as you get bigger, your Van der Waals forces get more prominent, so your boiling point is gonna go up. So like butane is gonna have a lower boiling point than hexane because butane is smaller than hexane, okay? Okay, and then this is something that you'll learn about later. Don't worry about this. Uh, don't worry about this uh, slide too much right now. Uh, and then this is showing hydrogen bonding. Let me see here. So here's boiling point. So we can see here, this pentane has only Van der Waals forces. This butanol has Van der Waals and hydrogen, or not hydrogen bonding, uh, dipole dipole, but no hydrogen bonding. And this guy here has Van der Waals and hydrogen bonding. So that's why this has the highest boiling point and this has the lowest boiling point, and this one falls right in the middle, okay? Okay, and so one last question, can you help with the melting point and the structure of the molecule? So this isn't something that comes in too, uh, too much, but generally the melting point will follow along with the, this rule here. The more, uh, the more intermolecular forces you have, the, the higher the, the melting point. However, here, uh, sometimes when you only have um, one 
if you, you if you can't compare intermolecular forces, so like with 2-methylbutane and 2,2-dimethylpropane, both of them only have van der Waals, so then we have to go to their structure. And the one that is, uh, is able to pack closer together is going to have the higher melting point, okay? Does that all make sense for everybody? And if there are no more questions, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this review. Uh, thank you so much for coming, and uh, I hope I covered all of your questions. Uh, so I will see you guys at my office hours. Again, reminder, those still happen. They will still happen this Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern, and they will continue to happen every Friday at 3 p.m., although I don't expect a lot of you to come this Friday because, well, uh, it's the Friday after a test, and you all are going to be comatose, probably. But again, thank you so much for coming, and uh, I'll see you guys next time.